Um, so we went over this already. Please remain muted um, to avoid background noise. Ask questions anytime by typing them in the chat. So uh, the focus today is kind of broken down into um, pruning basics, um, detecting and diagnosing problems. Not a huge amount of detail into that, but a little bit uh, in just kind of what to look for. And then um, holistic sprays and winter preparation. So we'll kind of take a break after each of those sections and there'll be an opportunity to ask uh, questions in the chat box and, oops. Okay, so pruning. So, um, oh, and I'll, um, there are some handouts that you'll be receiving um, in, in the other, in GoToWebinar when we were using that, we were able to include the handouts in, um, when, once you log into the vi video um, to the webinar, but that's not an option here right now. So they'll be emailed to you uh, after the webinar, just so you know, um, you can still take notes, but you'll have some, you'll have pretty much uh, all of this information will be sent to you um, in the handouts and provided. So, so just listen and enjoy. Um, so why do we prune? Um, there are four main reasons to prune. The first is because we want ripe fruit <laughs> and um, the sunlight is needed to ripen the fruit properly. So we want, we want sunlight to reach all the fruit um, to be able to, to um, bring it to fruition so that we can enjoy it on our plates. Um, the, the second and equally important is to allow breezes to get through and um, fungal diseases are a big problem for fruit trees um, and the holistic sprays that we're going to talk about later in the workshop um, are all really important as well for, for helping your plants avoid these but um, allowing it after a rain event you want all that moisture in in the branches and the trunk and on the fruit and on the leaves and everything to dry up within uh, 24 hours or less so um, so you really want good breezes to be able to get through and if your tree is too crowded and there's uh, branches crossing everywhere and um, it's very congested then then it's not going to dry out well you'll have moisture pockets and that's when fungal issues happen and um, third is to create a good structural frame. So if once you have good, a good structural frame, it, um, it, it allows all the sunlight to, to reach the fruit, but it also makes your branches stronger and they're able to withhold, uh, to withstand heavier fruit loads um, and snow loads or ice storms or all sorts of crazy weather we get up here. Um, so uh, proper pruning and shaping is really important for that. And then um, finally to encourage fruiting spurs. So fruits um, are, are developed on different ages of wood depending on the type of tree it is. So pruning um, can be done to encourage the, the ages of, of fruiting spurs that you need. Mm. So shaping the tree. Um, it's kind of like when you're looking at a painting in a gallery and you look up close and then you step back and, and take it all in and then you can go up close and look at the details. And so you're kind of doing the same when you're pruning. Um, you're, the first thing to do is look at it from a distance, taking the overall shape of the tree and, um, and kind of see if you can throw, you, you, you want to be able to throw a football through your branches between your, your structural scaffolding branches. So, um, so look at that, look at where the light's getting through, where it's not, where breezes might not be getting through. Um, and then once you get up closer to the tree, you can see, okay, well, which branches are crossing or what, what's, what's causing this congestion here. And then look at with the details of which ones you're going to remove to open it up. Um, and then after you take a few branches out and you kind of step back again and, and okay, now, now is there stuff that I'm seeing now that I didn't see before? Um, uh, and I want to say that it, it's like getting a haircut. Trees, trees will keep growing no matter how much we butcher them. <laughs> so there are a few key things to avoid, like, like don't cut off, uh, 
um, you know, if you've got a multi-species tree, like a, you know, a four in one that has four different species of apple on it or something, you don't want to prune off an entire species of apple from your tree. But other than that, basically the trees will recover just like our hair does from bad haircuts. Um, so don't be scared to start. I find a lot of people don't prune their fruit trees just because they're, they're terrified they're going to make a mistake and the tree will recover. There's always an opportunity to, to change things. What's worse is to wait 10 years before you start pruning and then it's very hard to, to catch up and to, you're never going to have the, the, the structural frame that you want um, because the branches are too big. The, the larger the, um, a branch is when you remove it from the tree, the harder it is for the tree to heal from it. And so the, the smaller things are when you remove them and shape it, the better for the overall health of the tree. Um, and, uh, and it's easier. You don't have to worry as much about, um, about things, about making the wrong, the wrong moves. Uh, so yeah, so try to envision the branches, but also the space between them and how chosen limbs will grow to fill that space. So that's, um, uh, part of this from pattern to details going in and out of the, of the, of how you look at the fruit tree. Um, so then once we'll talk about the different kinds of cuts that you can make, but one of them you're, you're, you're making that cut um, specifically to direct future growth of the tree in the direction you want it. Um, Michael Phillips is, is one of my gurus and um, uh, I don't take like, I don't take selfies ever actually. I think I've taken three in my life and I, he was at the Ecolog um, Ecological Farmers Association conference two years ago and I was so excited and I took a selfie and I posted it online <laughs> on social media. I was like, why that? So anyways, Michael Phillips, um, he wrote um, The Apple Grower and The Holistic Orchard and um, I follow a lot of his teachings and how I care for my trees. So um, he talks about aiming for tree calmness. You don't want to take off too much of the tree and spur excessive growth. Um, and, but you also want to take off enough to make sure that you have um, fruiting. When you prune a tree, it, it's kind of, it scares the tree into thinking that there's something wrong um, or that it's, you know, that it's not, it's going to die maybe. And so it makes lots of babies to try and um, uh, keep its DNA going in, in its fruit and in, in offspring. Um, so that's one of the reasons we prune as well is to encourage the tree to bear fruit. Um, the ideal branch angle is between 45 and 60 degrees from the trunk. So the more, basically the more horizontal your branch is, um, the stronger that union will be and the, the better structural frame you'll have, the, the branch will be able to bear more weight. If you have, um, if your branch is growing fairly vertical and, and close to the main trunk, um, that, that union is not very strong. And, um, and if you have a heavy load of fruit, it will, it will weight the branch down. Um, but at that point, the, the, the branch might not be as flexible enough. It, it takes a few years to get fruit usually. So if, you've, if that branch has already been there for a few years, it might have um, solidified in that shape that you, um, oh, looks like somebody got dropped out of the meeting and Zahara is coming back in. Um, so um, where was I? Yeah, it, it, the more horizontal your branch is, the stronger that branch union and the more weight it can bear, but also um, the more fruitful it is. So for some reason, the, it, it bears more fruit when it's, when it's stressed out into that um, horizontal position. I've even seen some orchards where they have them like pointed down towards the ground. I think that's a little ugly. I wouldn't, I don't, wouldn't want to do that to my trees, but um, I do have some sort of espalier, very rough espalier I'm doing with some pears in my yard. Um, they, um, yeah, I'm, I'm training them to be more or less horizontal. Um, uh, oh, somebody asked, can a tree be too young to prune? Uh, no, definitely not. Um, the, the first time you prune should be when you plant your tree. So, um, whether it's a bare root or a potted tree, um, the roots will be, 
I guess if it's a potted tree, the roots aren't going to be cut a bit, but I, um, do we talk about, I can't remember if we talk about bare root trees in a bit. Yeah, we do when we talk about the holistic sprays. So um, essentially a bare root tree um, is, is planted when it's dormant um, in the spring or in late fall. And um, its roots have been pruned when it was dug up out of the ground. So you need to prune the top um, so that there's a balance of, of energy um, in, the, in the tree. Um, and as, as soon as you plant that tree, you want to do a, a cut on it to establish the height that you want. Um, I mean, I guess if it's already at the, at the first branches are where you want them to be, then you could leave it. But um, in urban areas, um, usually you're aiming for smaller trees. And so there's, um, it's in the resources in the handouts, but there's a book um, that I've just been following for the last couple of years called Grow a Little Fruit Tree. Um, and she tells you that you should um, cut your your sapling to two feet when you get it. And it's a little, you're like, what? This poor tree, I just planted it. I'm cutting off half of the tree. Um, and it's, but I'm, yeah, I'm experimenting with it. So far it's working all right. <laughs> My trees are only two years old, so they don't have, uh, they haven't fruited yet. But next year I think they should. Um, so the short answer is no, it can't be too young to prune. Um, this, so, okay, so let's get back to um, pruning shape now. So there are two, there are several, three different kinds of forms of trees that are generally, um, that we generally try and work with. Um, this one is a central leader. So it's got kind of that traditional main trunk and then it's got the, scaf the, the scaffolding branches coming off the sides and they're nicely spaced apart. Um, this is usually how we train palm fruit, like apples and pears. Um, these kinds of trees fruit best on wood that is three to 10 years old. So you need to plan ahead uh, for those three-year-old fruiting spurs. And then after, after it's been fruiting for 10 years a spur, then you can do what's called renewal pruning and you can try and establish new um, scaffolding branches that, that will become productive branches. Um, the open vase is usually used for peaches, nectarines, and apricots. And um, this allows, they're more prone to fungal diseases. So this is just a more open shape and allows um, more breeze, breezes to get through and more sun for ripening. Um, and uh, Japanese plums can also be trained this way. And then a modified central leader is usually used for cherries and European plums, sometimes for apricots. So here's where we kind of have, um, there's sort of a main trunk, but it, it zigzags a bit, zigzags back and forth. It's not as, as straight up and down like, a, like an apple or pear. Okay, so now we get into the two different kinds of cuts, thinning cuts and heading cuts. Um, Just trying to move my chat boxes out of the way so I can see the slide too. <laughs> um, so um, a thinning cut. This is the um, this is the main type of pruning that you're going to be do doing a young tree. This is really for shaping the tree. Um, this is where you're removing a branch at its juncture um, at at the the crotch where it meets the parent limb. So you're first you're removing um, branches. Um, well, the first thing you're starting with is any dead or diseased wood um, on the tree. Dead or diseased branches, you remove the entire branch. Um, if it's something like a fungal disease or bacterial, like bacterial canker, you, you don't want to be composting that material or chipping it or leaving it under your tree. You want to just remove it from your site um, to prevent it from, from spreading and staying around. Um, so after you've removed your dead and dying um, branches, then you're removing branches that are crowding others. So anything that's crossing, um, crossing with other branches or, or will be in the future, you want to keep that space open so you can think ahead, plan ahead for the, that open space. Um, 
and um, you thin from the top down so that you're following the sun's path and how it's going to reach the fruit. Um, so crossing branches, also limbs that are growing towards the middle of the tree, um, they're going to become problematic down the road. So if you cut them off when they're younger, they'll, they'll heal more quickly and, and keep that open space there um, and allow for good, good fruit ripening. Um, also uh, branches that have a really narrow crotch angle. So if, if the branch is young enough then you, and you want to keep it, then you can usually train it out um, to not have such a narrow crotch. But um, yeah, if it's a little bit older and it's, you can, you're unable to shape it anymore, um, or if it's not in the right location, then just remove it completely. Uh, overly tall leaders um, and spent wood that isn't bearing well anymore. So that's what I was talking about. If the after um, pear or apple has been bearing for 10, 10 plus years on the same spurs, it won't, um, um, it won't be as productive. And so then you can start planning ahead for, for other uh, fruiting spurs. And um, yeah, if you cut, so what's important um, in allowing the tree to, to heal quickly um, is that you're cutting right back to the junction of the branch. So you'll see there's a special kind of bark there that is uh, rougher and kind of looks like elephant, like an elephant foot or elephant knees, I say. Um, and it, um, that there's special cells in there that as soon as that, as soon as that branch is cut off, they will grow like crazy to try and heal that wound and they'll close it off. Um, and it drives me nuts when I see people who've pruned their trees and they leave those little stubs, little branch stubs um, that are going to die and they're just going to introduce disease and moisture into the tree and insects. So you want to cut right back to the main trunk or to the main branch and then it can heal. Um, somebody asked if you can burn the limbs as a method, as a method of getting them off the property. Um, you some some you some diseases you could but um uh like with black knot i i wouldn't um i i find it easiest rule is just to get it off the property if it's diseased um if it's stuff that's healthy then it, like and it doesn't have disease uh in it then then go right ahead or, or even better compost it or chip it um but uh, if it's diseased, it's just safer to get rid of it. I suppose on that note, there was another question there. My lime tree gives fruit all year long. What do you recommend during the winter time? Should I cover it to protect it, uh, to protect the flower? Um, so again, I'm not, I'm not that familiar with tropical trees. Um, I'm assuming your lime tree is indoors, um, unless you're not from Ontario, Sylvia. <laughs> um, your lime tree is probably indoors. I know people who grow citrus fruit. Um, they bring it in, they bring it in in the winter, and they have it under grow lights. Um, so you, you, yeah, you wouldn't be able to leave it outside um, in the winter in Ontario. Uh, oops, I didn't cut, sorry. Am I doing that? There we go. Um, and then uh, after this slide, there'll be a couple of little videos um, and they'll I'll, wa I'll walk through these top, um, topics again, the heading cut and the thinning cut, and I'll show them, um, show them to you. Pruning in action, even though you're sitting at your desk. Um, okay, so a heading cut is very different uh, than a, from a thinning cut. It's made across the branch, away from the branch union. So they don't heal as well, especially in larger diameter branches, and um, they spur more growth. So um, this is one of the problems with people, people who don't know about pruning and then prune, is that they just make these head, they think, oh, I want, this is how, you know, I want my tree to sort of stop here, and they make all these heading cuts. They basically like with a hedge pruner or something, a fruit tree is not a hedge. <laughs> a hedge, hedge pruning is done to make the hedge bushier and to fill in and give you privacy. Um, heading cuts on fruit trees just make, make spur growth and make them really bushy and hedgy and, uh, and not allow sun through for ripening and not allow, um, not allow uh, 
drying breezes through either. Um, so, so heading cuts are done specifically um, on leaders that are getting too tall or even branches that are getting too lanky. So if you have a lot of growth in a cup in some branches um, that are getting, they're really thin and, and, and lanky, um, you can cut them back um, to encourage them to put more energy into getting thicker instead of longer for the rest of the season. Um, and, uh, and this is what, what the heading cut is great for is allowing you to direct where new branching will happen. So, um, you, you cut just above a bud that you want to encourage the growth of. So, um, I'll go over that in the video, but basically where you cut, you'll get regrowth happening just below that. So whichever direction the bud is there, um, you want to pick a bud that's, that's aiming away from the middle of the tree and away from other branches, and, then, and that'll direct the growth, growth that way. Um, it keeps fruit production happening closer to the trunk. And... Um, it's, so yeah, um, varieties that fruit on new wood um, need a bit more of this because they um, uh, it encourages lots of new shoots. So the the like um, peaches, apricots um, that fruit on new growth. And yeah, I talked about um, doing it in the direction of new growth. Um, okay, so somebody um, asked about if you're not burning diseased wood, um, then what are your options? Where can you take it? And yeah, you can anywhere that you're, um, uh, you can put it in out with your, um, with the stuff that you're taking to the curb, your brush, your brush and your leaves and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it'll, it'll be dealt with off site. Um, and just get it off your property. Yeah. Um, Shane, I'll, I'll answer that question later in the webinar about when timing, timing of pruning. Um, okay, so this was, this was me in April, just before I had, <laughs> had my baby, you'll see my big belly. Um, he's three months old now. Um, so, uh, and I apologize for the wind there. It was a windy day. Um, um, but you should still be able to hear pretty well. Um, so here, the first thing I'm going to demonstrate the thinning cuts, and then there'll be a second video that'll demonstrate the heading cuts. Okay, so this, this is a cherry tree that was planted a few years ago and hasn't been pruned at all yet. And uh, there's some major problems with it. It's, it's doing pretty well, but there are some branches that are undesirable. Um, and if we want more more fruit, then we're gonna we're gonna do some pruning on it to keep it healthy and productive. Um, you can see that this is where the point of the graft was. So the branches above this point are the ones the cherry that we want. This big branch, unfortunately, this nice healthy branch, is growing below the point of the graft. So we don't know what kind of cherries this will produce, if any. And so that's the first thing we're going to remove. And we're going to do um, a thinning cut on it, which means we're going to remove the branch at the base. You can see here, there, there, an old thinning cut was done here. And then that special, those special cells and bark are growing over to slowly close that up. If you leave a little stub, which is the mistake that most pruners make, you leave that little stub there, it's just gonna rot and dry out and bring infection into the tree and the tree won't be able to close its wound properly. So you need to cut right up to this special bark that has, looks kind of like wrinkled skin. That's where you cut up to. I'll do a demo actually on this branch we're taking off. So this, this skin that's right around here, is the special skin that's going to be able to, or the special cells that are going to easily... Sorry, I was using really unsharp pruners. <laughs> <laughs> so now this should be able to close over nicely. And the, sm the smaller the branch is when you take it off, the more easily that wound will heal. This was taken off when it was pretty big, so that will still take a couple years to grow over, unfortunately. Um, 
And this one, I'm gonna use a bigger tool for. Might make two cuts here to get as close as I want. If you take these branches and put them in a vase at home, they'll flower. <laughs> You'll have a nice fragrant bouquet. So now I'm going to clean this up and get a little closer to the I can. I might need my saw for that. Okay, I'll, I'll do that later with my saw and get nice up up close to that, that bark that will we'll peel that over. It's too bad this wasn't cut when it was uh, smaller because now that's a big wound for the tree to heal. Um, so this, these are, these branches are suspect, I'm not sure what they'll be from, what, whether the rootstock or the, they're kind of right at the graft point. So, um, and then this is where, this is a multi cultivar tree, a four in one. So it has glacier, bing, uh, Stella and Van. So obviously we don't want to cut those branches off and really they're doing okay. One thing we would want to do is weight these down so that we have a better branch angle here. The, the closer this is up to the tree, the tighter this crotch angle, the less healthy, um, the less weight it can bear uh, and the, the weaker this union is. So if we pull this down for a year and let it grow out as horizontally as possible, then this will be nice strong bark here and it'll be able to withstand winds and sn heavy snows and ice storms and uh, lots of fruit. For the cherry you don't have to worry about some heavy loads as much but with an apple or pear you can actually break the branches sometimes if, um, if there's a lot of fruit. Um, so Okay um, and just to um, uh, I'll just quickly go over the uh, grafting in case um, people aren't um, familiar with that. The, basically fruit trees don't generally grow true to, true to seed. So if you planted the seeds from an, uh, a Macintosh apple, you wouldn't get Macintosh apples. You would get something completely different. It would still be an apple, but it might not even be edible. It might be good for making cider. Uh, it might be good for baking. Who knows? Um, so what we do is graft. So the root stock is usually different from the scion wood, which is what we're growing up top. So you, you take a cutting off of a Macintosh apple tree and then basically surgically attach that to the root stock of a different tree, a different apple root, uh, um, apple cultivar. So, um, so pretty much all fruit trees are done that way. It also makes them fruit um, at a year earlier age. If you start something from seed, it could take 10 years to bear fruit. Whereas if it's grafted, it would, it usually bears fruit in less than five years. Um, so, um, uh, and that graft point is usually um, kind of three inches or, or lower to the ground or three inches um, at the most really from, from the roots. Um, and it's important when you're planting to not bury that, the site of the graft, um, because it's, it, you'll, well, you'll have lots of shoots growing from the rootstock at that point um, that you don't want. And uh, it's also a point of disease entry if it's moist all the time. Um, Zahara asked what you weight the branches with. Um, so I usually just use, um, like a sizal twine or something um, because then it just it it degrades it basically falls apart within a year on its own in case I forget to come out and, and release the limb. Um, you can buy uh, branch trainers that you or use clothes pins at the at the crotch where, that you put on the tree and then you put them on the limb and you push it apart. I've always found it much easier to just tie a string um, halfway down the branch, weight it down with a brick or, um, or a rock or something. Uh, and then like, I actually just removed one from my pair today that, um, it had, it had broken. It was still tied around the branch, but it had broken free from the rock cause it just weathered.
Um, and then Jen asks about if you graft three different apple varieties onto one tree, one tree can fruit multiple varieties of apples. Yes, exactly. Um, so you can theoretically, you could even graft pe pears onto an apple um, and you could graft cherries onto a plum and nectarines onto an apricot. So technically stone fruit can be grafted to stone fruit and um, seed fruit or palm fruit can be grafted to palm fruit, but it's it doesn't always work as well in practice. Um, but then you get these chimera trees that are really cool. Um, so if you have small spaces, um, I mean, apples, usually there's, usually there's um, crab apples around that will serve as a pollinator for your apple tree, but a lot of fruit trees need, um, you need two different varieties for them to pollinate each other. Um, so if you have a small space that you're working with, you can, you can graft um, multiple varieties onto one tree and then you solve your pollination problem. Uh, how do you graft them? That's an entirely different webinar. <laughs> There's several different types of grafting. You can do bench grafting, uh, tongue and groove grafting, bud grafting. There's multiple options. Um, uh, what about the twine damaging sawing the bark? Um, I've never had a problem with that. I, just, I tie it loosely. It's, um, it's, not, it's not tied tightly, so it's not going to um, entangle the tree. And, um, and I just don't, yeah, I've never had any like sign, you know, you think if the wind is moving it around that it's maybe rubbing, but it's soft enough. It's not been a problem for me before. So when am I going to do the webinar on grafting? <laughs> uh, I don't know, Reforest, we'll have to talk about, talk about it. <laughs> I wrote it down. <laughs> um, right. I mean, I, I only know one kind of grafting. I know how to do bench grafting. Um, and well, I do have a tool that, to do tongue and groove, but I, I prefer bench grafting. Um, I might not be the person to teach that webinar, but Kelsey, we can find somebody. <laughs> Especially if it's a webinar, I've got contacts. I don't know somebody locally here I would recommend necessarily, but um, yeah, grafting And it grafting doesn't fun. necessarily have to be somebody local, which is nice with the webinars. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I'm finding that like grafting and just anything related to eating, you know, locally grown food like foraging or urban agriculture, they're all super common topics. So we were talking about maybe uh, having more along that along those lines. So actually, Jessica, if you end up thinking of anybody where we can um, point people to, I could include it in the follow up email. Um, and if not, yeah, I'll look into it. Sure. I mean, there's lots of videos on YouTube. Um, the person who caught, taught me, Ken Taylor, from um, the Green Barn Nursery, he, uh, I don't think he, he's an older guy. I don't think he has, like, YouTube videos out there and stuff. <laughs> but there are lots of people who do. Um, so that would be the, I would start with that. Just look up grafting. Um, and maybe the specific, like, if you want, if you have an apple tree, grafting apple trees or grafting cherry trees or something. Um, uh, and yeah, and there's different techniques. So depending on the size of your tree and um, and where you're getting your scion wood from and stuff, and what time of year you're doing it, it will impact that. Um, and then Melanie says, if we are not speaking of older trees today and planning for fruiting spurs, please make that a future webinar as well. Okay. Um, yeah, we we don't really spend a lot of time on that. Um, uh, I mean, heading cuts are how you plan ahead for, for fruiting spurs. Um, but yeah, Kelsey and I can talk about that as well. Um, whoops. Okay, so, uh, okay, so this let's do the video on heading cuts now. Oh, oh and branch training, I forgot. <laughs> Sorry, I haven't watched this since May or whenever we did the, yeah, end of April. Um, so I'll demonstrate how I weighed it down. And I think I just used sticks here, which is even easier than finding a rock or a brick. Um, okay, so we're gonna talk about um, a heading cut now. We did some thinning cuts, and then we're also gonna weight some branches down. So 
Um, this branch of unknown source could be rootstock, could, could not be. We'll, we're going to leave it for now. Um, but uh, this I know is an important one to keep because this is the band cherry. So I want to give this lots of room to grow. So I'm going to cut this one. I'm going to cut it back not at the base, that would be a heading, uh, fitting cut. I'm going to do a heading cut, and if I do it, if I do it here, then this branch will become dominant. If I do it here, then this branch will become dominant. I don't want branches growing in towards the trunk. I want to direct the growth of this out from the, the base. So I want, I'm going to choose this branch to be dominant, which is leaving a good gap from there. There should be lots of room for the growth to grow. So I'm going to cut this off right here. And now this branch will become the main stem here. And if there's a nice gap there, there's lots of air can get through there. Moisture can dry off so that we don't have root rot, uh, rot problems. Sorry. Um, one of the things you're thinking about when you're pruning is opening up the frame so that you have lots of sunlight coming in to ripen the fruit. Um, but most importantly, actually, is, is the uh, breezes to dry things out after a rain to reduce fungal problems. Um, I'm going to cut this one off as well to, well, maybe we'll weight it down first and then see what we want to do. I'm going to weight this one down. This, this angle's not bad, but it'll be a more productive branch it's tied down on a more horizontal angle and it's still thin enough it's still thin enough that it's flexible and it shouldn't have a problem adjusting to that I'm just going to do a loose I'm not going to tie it tight around the trunk I'm just going to do a loose knot that and this this sizal twine will easily just decompose when it's and by the time it decomposes the branch will be done. This is a very easy. You can use a brick or a rock or <laughs> lots of different things to stronger join here um, and it'll get more light in there as well. So then if I weight this one down, probably not. Maybe this one will be the dominant branch. So we cut that there. Find some more sticks. I'll weight this down, and then and maybe this one as well could get weighted down. Then you've got nice open form. Um, and if you want to spur production, so cherries will grow on first year growth. So if you want to spur more branching, um, you can cut off, do some some heading cuts here. To spur these to, to branch out and then we would get more a little more fruit on these but I think I've taken enough off this tree for this year that big that first big limb we took off was 
pretty substantial. You never want to take off more than one third of the tree. So we'll leave this for this year and then maybe next year. These two look like they're going to interfere a bit. So we'll probably take one of those out um, or just train, train the branches away from each other. Okay. <laughs> So I see everybody can hear my dog there. I was, trying, I was hoping with my headphones, uh, you couldn't. <laughs> She's a big 14 year old shepherd who's a suck. Um, so I apologize for that. <laughs> it looks like she's decided to go lie down. Um, we have a dog door, so she's, she can go in and out as she chooses. She's, she's okay. She just wants attention. Um, Okay, so um, we'll talk a little bit about the renewal pruning here for the, um, and this will help with the, somebody, uh, the person who, Melanie, who has um, an old apple tree in the house they just moved into. Um, so on an apple and pear um, in the second uh, branch down, you can see that um, you make that heading cut there and then, uh, and then you have branching happening um, a branch growing just below that where you made that heading cut um, and um, that spurs the fruiting spurs fruiting spurs it encourages fruiting spurs to grow um, behind that point so fruit will be produced there in the third year and then you can trim those laterals back and um, and then when that branch is done if one, once that's been fruiting for 10 years and you don't want you want to do your renewal pruning so and you can see in the last image at the bottom they've they've removed the main branch and they've chosen one of those fruiting spurs to become now become the main uh um the main structural uh scaffold and then the fruiting spurs will grow off of that so that's kind of renewal pruning in a nutshell um in an apple core, something like that. Um, but yeah, we don't have time to go into a lot more than that. Um, so timing of pruning and timing, let's see what, okay, it's six, almost 6.30. So um, well, I wanna get into the holistic sprays and stuff soon. So timing of pruning, um, traditionally people are, think of doing most of their major pruning in February, March in late winter before uh, bud break. So when the trees are still dormant. And um, what I've been learning more recently though, is that um, what happens when you do that, unfortunately, is that you get really vigorous regrowth because um, when the tree went to sleep in the fall, it had, you know, X number of branches and it produced enough sugar and stored enough sugar over the winter to support all those branches in the spring when it comes out of dormancy and suddenly you've removed a third of them or or a quarter of them or something um, you never want to remove more than a third of a tree at a t at one time um, so you've removed up to a third of the tree and then all those all that sugar and food that is stored um, it wants to send it somewhere. So it sends it up to the existing branches and then it also sends it up to new growth. And so it gets used for vigorous regrowth. And then you have a lot of um, uh, water sprouts that just grow straight up vertically from the tree and they're not very productive um, and they take energy away from, from fruit production. So, um, so this is still a good time. Late winter is still a good time to be doing um, removing any diseased or dead trees, uh, dead dead branches, um, and you can still do some major pruning there as well. But um, my preferred time of year now to be pruning is in um, uh, in early summer. So around exactly around the solstice is the perfect time to do it. After after the end of June. The tree is already starting to go dormant. It's already starting to store sugars for um, for the winter. So if you can cut around the solstice, um, the, uh, then you're not going to have that vigorous regrowth. Um, so if you're trying to keep your tree small, that's the best time to do it. And there's still lots of time for the tree to recover um, before it goes dormant. Um, and then that's also, right, that's also the time. So if you did heading cuts in the winter 
and there's a lot of regrowth from that, then solstice is the time to take care of those, that extra regrowth. Um, and then in late summer, trees, yeah, right, I just said trees are already entering the dormancy by late July. Um, so, uh, but taking out things like water sprouts now that have, have occurred since you're pruning, the, the water sprouts, are there, they, they're usually pretty easy to identify. They basically go straight up. So usually branches kind of grow out on different angles, uh, you know, all these weird wacky angles. Water sprouts literally are like completely vertical and, uh, and they'll be growing four times faster than any of your other branches. <laughs> so um, th that's when you want to be taking them out and um, ensuring that you still have lots of airflow um, and sun uh, in your tree so that your fruit can, can dry up and continue to grow and ripen. Oh, goodness, sorry. Um, so here's an example of what you might do um, over five years with a young tree. So you can see the first um, at planting, doing that heading cut will, will spur branching to happen at that spot. Um, and then you can, you can select, uh, select which branches you're gonna keep. In the second year, you can um, start doing some training. And um, so there in the third spring, you can see the pictures of the water sprouts that are just growing straight up. So those are removed, uh, more, tr more spreading of the limbs to um, to weight them down and encourage a good angle on them. Um, in the fourth spring, you can do some, um, uh, continue to open up the removed branches. You want sort of ideally um, 10 inches or 10 inches or more between your major scaffolding branches to let enough um, air and, and light through. So, um, and that, that gap will stay pretty consistent, even as the trunk gets bigger and the branches, I mean, the width of the branches will make them end up a little bit closer together. But if they start out 12 inches apart, they're, they're kind of gonna, the, the center of them will stay 12 inches apart more or less for the, for the lifespan of that tree. So um, that's, for, that's kind of, uh, you know, for good urban um, small trees. I, you could go to eight inches, but, 10 inches to 12 inches is good for your major branches. Uh, and then the fifth spring, um, choosing your final scaffolding branches. So, th and these, you, you want them to be um, kind of alternating uh, around the tree so that you, you're getting good uh, light and wind access all the way around the tree. Um, and, uh, Uh, and then you can, yeah, still be doing a, a head and cut to, to have more branching happening there. Okay, so um, before we go on to the next, prob uh, next part, um, let's uh, look at the questions again. Um, um, Naomi, my tree whips had basically no extra shoot buds to remove when it leafed out in spring. Lucky or a sign that it may be too vigorous? Um, no, I, I would say it's just not ready to produce shoots yet. It's, it's too young. Um, you could still be doing your heading cut on it when, um, when it's a whip. Uh, and if it hasn't produced branches yet, it, maybe it just needs to put energy into root growth right now. Um, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, Kelsey, I have somebody in the waiting room who, uh, but there's no name. It's a, the number is one eight three two seven eight eight five seven two three. It seems strange. Should I admit them into the meeting, <laughs> into the webinar or not? You know what? I think I would take a chance. I know they've Im improved their security and there's still a number of signups who are not on, so. Okay, because that's not a phone number. I guess it's a, I don't know, their account number or something. Okay, so I will admit them. Um, 
Okay, so um, any other questions before we move on to, to disease? Diagnosing and detecting disease. Can we see my dog? <laughs> I don't know if you can, uh, well, I, don't, I can't even see my video. Is my, can you see me right now? No, yes, you can't see me. Oh, can you? Oh, oops. <laughs> but hopefully I haven't been picking my nose. I thought you could just see my screen. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I'll try and turn the screen so you can see my dog, but she's kind of dark over there. She's it based on because you made a phone call. Um, okay, the number okay. was a phone call. Oh, okay, they've muted themselves. Thank you. I, I, mu I muted them. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know what that was. Um, okay, uh, so okay, so any questions about <laughs> pruning and stuff before we um, before we go on to detecting and diagnosing problems. Okay, so um, so uh, the first the first thing to consider is if uh, if you haven't purchased a tree yet, or you're going to be purchasing more trees. I know most people in the webinar already have trees, um, but you know, we kind of become collectors, it's hard to stop <laughs> until you run out of room. So maybe you've run out of room, or maybe you're going to grow a little eight foot tall fruit tree. Um, and, uh, and you can squeeze in a few more now. So, so the most important step is to pick varieties that are disease resistant. And um, any self respecting nursery should be able to tell you um, the disease resistance of their trees, what's susceptible to what or what's not, um, what's not susceptible. Um, and then, um, incur so just like if we eat crappy food, we don't do well. If, um, if we feed our trees crappy soil, um, they're not going to be very healthy either. So encouraging, um, a healthy, diverse ecosystem in the soil and on your tree are is the next important thing and so that's what we're going to talk that's why we're going to talk about holistic sprays for your trees um, because that they're kind of like probiotics for your tree they they introduce healthy bacteria healthy fungal organisms um, and encourage um, a healthy immune system in your tree and then they can fight off pests and, and diseases um, it's actually fascinating that um, insects can't digest a healthy plant. So they only attack plants that are not healthy. Um, that kind of blew me away when I learned it. I was like, what? <laughs> um, but they, the um, amino acids are incomplete in, um, in unhealthy plants because they're, they're not fully metabolizing. And, um, or, and yeah, the plant, the insects can't metabolize them, um, a complete protein. So they, um, they don't attack trees that are healthy. Um, and then monitoring is important. So um, I, I believe in having a diverse garden and a diverse system that is going to bring in the predators that I need. If I have a problem, I, you know, regularly will have um, some aphids show up on, on my current bushes and things, and I'll just watch and wait and um, maybe squish some of them. But usually I figure the more there are, the faster <laughs> the, the ladybugs will come in and find them. Um, and inevitably they do because I have, um, I have a lot of other stuff going on in my garden that supports life. And so we have predatory wasps and ladybugs and frogs and toads and um, uh, so um, so just keep keep an eye on um, on your plants and if you see pests the first thing to do is figure out what they are so identify them and um, and then you can determine whether you need to deal with them or not maybe they're beneficial insects um, 
this last week I was up at my mom's cottage and there are these really kind of scary looking wasps flying around right outside the door and the, the back door and they had made all these beautiful mud nests um, in the, in underneath the awning and um, when but I looked them up and they're mud mud doppers and um, they're pretty harmless they very very rarely sting humans um, they look scary but they're awesome and they eat like 20 spiders uh, for they feed their babies when they lay their egg they paralyze spiders and stick them in the in there with the baby so that when they hatch they can devour these spiders so um, I mean I like having spiders around too but anyways know your enemy or know if they're not your enemy and then you don't need to worry about them um, and then um, uh, so some organisms are only a problem at a certain stage of growth so you might want to just monitor them until they are when they're at that stage of growth and then leave them be when they're not um, and then once you know what they are you can also figure out what you, who your allies are and who you want to bring in um, you can actually order like a, bags of ladybugs if, you know if you had a greenhouse or something and you needed to bring them in um, and so yeah that's an option if you had a big problem um, and then so then determine how much um, how much damage the pest is doing so just kind of keep an eye on it and um, if it's if it's a little bit of, if it's a little bit of a problem then they, they can usually the plant can usually recover um, if it's really stripping all the leaves like I had sawfly aphids on my um, uh, gooseberries for a couple of years and they would like two or three times a year they would completely defoliate it and it, it just never it, it didn't die but it just could never really fully recover and now it, I moved it to a new place um, and it's it's doing okay and it hasn't been suffering from them um, and so you know it it hurt the plant but it didn't kill it um, and uh, and now it's it's actually producing some fruit finally <laughs> um, and um yeah because once you so even doing things like a, like vinegar and soap and water and things once you start spraying um you're you're taking out all of the insects it's it's pretty impossible to just target the ones um unless you're going out there by hand and somebody made a comment about japanese beetles yeah japanese beetles big problem uh you never want them around <laughs> i just like smack them in my hands as hard as i can um some people tap them into a bucket of water um yeah i kill them whenever i see them um and manually is really the best way that i've found with them um yeah some people i've seen people put up uh like netting around their plants to protect them from Japanese beetles but they have to be small to do that obviously. Um, so for fungal and bacteria problems, um, fungal diseases need to be taken care of as soon as they're ident as soon as you know that there's a problem. Unfortunately usually by the time you know there's a problem it's it's too late. Um, oh here look I have a slide about insect pests. <laughs> Did I miss anything? Right for so for insect pests, should you trap it, repel it, attract beneficial allies, or use particular holistic sprays, or a mix of those things? Um, and then for um, uh, yeah, if there's major crop loss, then then um, then you can take action and try and take action just on that particular pest, not, not on other. Um, Naomi says nematodes to control lawn grubs in the fall will help lower adult Japanese beetle populations. That's great. So yeah, you can buy at garden centers, you can buy nematodes um, that you just um, you add the little thing to your hose and you water them into your lawn and then they eat the grubs and stuff and the Japanese beetle babies. Um, So fungal and bacterial, yeah. Usually um, once you see a fungal problem, it's, it's too late to stop it. Um, so you really have to be on the ball paying attention to those. Um, monitoring the season helps. So if you, if you know that it's been a wet spring and it's been cool and um, uh, there haven't been very good drying spells between rains um, with a good wind that's, really, that's helping, helping things, um, evaporate then 
then you've got to be extra cautious of, um, of fungal problems. And, um, uh, and then if you, if you have a problem that um, is going to be repeating, then um, you can start treating it earlier next year. Just assume it's going to come back and start treating for it. So I have, like, I have cedar apple rust, um, and uh, it just, it makes little orange spots on my apple trees, and it, it hasn't, it hasn't been too much of a problem yet, and I just, I just boost the immune, like, I try and keep the, the tree healthy, and it's, it's able to, it's, it's more of an aesthetic problem. It doesn't really affect it too much. Um, so this chart, um, this is in your handouts as well. So this is from the Holistic Orchard. It shows, um, can you, see, you can't see, can you see my cursor on the, on the screen? Like, if, okay, great. Yes, it's very small, but we can see it. Okay, thanks. Um, oh, ah. okay, so, um, So the fungal curve um, comes from the holistic orchard. So it shows um, one of the important things to look at first is root growth. So you see there's a big flush of root growth here um, just as the fruit is being set. And then again here in the fall, just uh, at harvest time. And so those are good times to be, um, to be uh, feeding the tree nutritional, nutritionally. Um, and then the um, the red is when you're going to have problems with um, uh, infection of things like apple scab and rust and and rots. So so this is this is when things are the wettest and the cool coolest, and you've got a lot of um, branches, uh, sorry, a lot of leaves coming out on the tree and fruitlets setting and stuff. Um, all this new growth. So if you colonize all that new growth with um, with good bacteria and good fungus right at the outset, um, then there'll be uh, there won't be room for the bad guys to establish themselves. And then uh, yeah, the green curve is where we can help, where we can support the um, the mycorrhiza in the ground. So mycorrhiza is basically this network, this web network of, um, it's, it's the roots of, of mushrooms, basically of fungus. Um, and they have very important relationships with your trees. And um, we'll talk about this in the holistic sprays a bit, uh, uh, about how to get those beneficial fungi into your soil. Um, okay, so any questions about that before we move on to holistic sprays? Okay, good. Um, so some of this is re I'm reiterating, but a healthy tree is um, is better able to fend off attacks and diseases. So if we can boost the immune system of our tree from within, then uh, it will be able to fight off problems by itself, and we're not going to need to do as much to to assist it. Um, usually, what we do is just like our, most of our Western medicine, we treat. Um, with short term with antibiotics, um, things that treat the symptom and not the underlying problem. And um, so if we can increase the health of the soil, um, then um, we're going to have a much healthier tree. So when and then also on the other, on the flip side is when these foliar sprays that we're doing on the tree, when we're, when we're coating the tree, um, the leaves and the, and the branches and stuff with, with healthy nutrition and stuff, it makes the tree photosynthesize at a, at a um, higher rate. 
And then it has more sugars to put into the soil, to sink into the soil and store for later, but also to feed the soil food web and to feed uh, the fungal, um, the fungal life down there. Um, basically, there's a tr there's a, a trade relationship between the fungus and the roots. So the the trees give sugars to the fungus, and uh, the the mycorrhiza gives. Um, water and nutrients and minerals to the tree. So if you think of the tree root system as going generally up to the drip line of the tree, it does spread a bit further than that, but most of it is under the drip line of the tree. And then the fungal network can extend that like two, three, four times out further. So that's how much more access it has to, uh, to water, to, um, to nutrients, to minerals in the soil. Um, There's a question about, uh, comp can I sprinkle compost on the soil? Okay, we'll talk about, um, we'll talk about compost and sprays and tea sprays um, as we get into this. Did I miss anything? Okay, so um, there's four holistic sprays that um, if you can only get them done in the spring, if, uh, I know the spring is when everything needs to happen in the garden, but um, it's really important to try and get these four on in the spring. And then um, there are, you can do additional ones later in the year uh, um, to, if you need to target certain problems with your plant, but, um, but they're not as critical as these first four. So the first one to do, this is the timing of them. So the first is that tight cluster to open cluster. So when your buds are just, um, they're just beginning to, to open up and you see a tiny bit of green on them. Um, and that, uh, and then pink is when the bud, the, the flower buds. So I'm talking about the leaf buds before and now the flower buds are just starting to open and you see a little tiny bit of pink. Um, but they're not open yet. You don't want to be spraying when the flowers are open because um, you're going to um, potentially harm pollinators and potentially harm the, the, the flower itself as well. Um, so you spray when it's pink and there's just a little bit of pink showing, um, but the flowers haven't opened. And then after petal fall is the third spray. And then first cover is about a week to 10 days after petal fall. Um, this is the base recipe for, um, for a five gallon backpack sprayer. This is what I have, um, what I use. And it, it'll do, um, you know, of young small fruit trees, you could probably do 15 trees to, with, with one five gallon uh, backpack sprayer. So if you have less trees than that, you can get smaller ones. We'll talk about equipment in a little bit. Um, so uh, two and a half ounces of pure neem oil, you have to emulsify this with dish soap um, so that it can mix with the, the water, otherwise it will just stay suspended. Um, 10 ounces of liquid fish oil, um, 6 to 12 ounces of microorgan effective microorganisms, and then liquid kelp for nutrition. So I'll go through each of these um, ingredients in a little more detail. So neem oil comes from um, the neem tree in, uh, in Africa, and um, it's been used medicinally for, for millennia. Um, it's full of terpenoids and isoflavonoids, and it's these secondary, um, these stimulate the plant metabolites. Um, they, sorry, they stimulate the immune response in the tree um, which helps them helps it fight off fungal diseases, and then the az aziracin also inhibits the molting cycle of things like codling moth um, and and other pests. Um, probably of Japanese beetle too, actually, which would be fantastic. And then um, the fatty acids in the neem are actually also really important, um, and they help feed the, the 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 beneficial fungi that you're introducing onto the tree um, and, uh, and give the tree a little bit of nutritional boost. So with the liquid fish oil, it's really important that it's, um, uh, it's a fish hydrolysate, that it hasn't been pasteurized. And um, this also has lots of fatty acids in, in it that are good for the, um, the soil food web and the fungus. Oh, here's my other dog, Coda Bear. Can you see Coda Bear? Say hi, Coda Bear. He's also like 12 or 13 
and he just likes to bark, not whine. Hey, buddy. Um, um, and uh, right, the liquid fish oil gives a nitrogen boost to the tree as well. So after first cover, um, you don't want to be putting the, as much liquid fish oil in because um, if you if it gets too much nitrogen at this after this point, um, it slows down its um, it slows down the hardening off process of the tree, like its its ability to come out of dormancy and um, uh, oh, and he turned the light off because <laughs> he's a smart dog. <laughs> um, Okay, so mm, oh, sh sh. so uh, effective microorganisms. You can buy these as uh, in a, in the notes. Um, there's resources, and it has um, where where you can buy some of these things. Um, effective microorganisms you can buy as a mother culture, um, which is the easiest thing to do. And then if you're doing really large quantities, like an orchard, then you can you can grow that out. Um, but um, uh, it takes some time. It takes a couple weeks and you have to keep it at the right temperature and stuff. Um, so it's not that easy. Um, the effect of microorganisms um, in, are you're basically adding to the diversity of the soil. Um, they help in, they it help the tree grow, they increase your yield, um, they increase the disease resistance and the quality of the fruit. Um, there is lactic acid bacteria, yeast, photosynthetic bacteria in, in a whole array of stuff in them. Um, there are some people who think that you should use local um, microorganisms and not be introducing them from elsewhere. Um, and um, I, I think that the more diversity, the better in it. Um, uh, but if you can learn how to make your own effective microorganisms by taking some, some healthy forest soil if you want. Um, I've seen them in Cuba. Um, I did a, a sustainable agriculture tour in Cuba eight years ago and, uh, and the farmers there were making, brewing their own effective microorganisms um, by starting with healthy, healthy local soil. So there is a way to do that yourself if you have the time and energy to do that. Um, and then liquid kelp, um, has lots of uh, micronutrients and macronutrients, uh, pretty much everything in it that your plant needs. And then um, because it's in liquid form and it, it's, it's very readily available for, um, for the soil food web to, to uh, take in and add to the, its cycle of life. Um, so this is an example of this, the five gallon sprayer that I have. And then there's, you can get a two gallon sprayer. You can get uh, one gallon ones as well. I've seen like a pony pump. Um, Whiffle Tree Nursery um, has quite a variety of sizes and they sell uh, pretty much all the ingredients for the, um, to make your brew as well. Um, So um, this competitive colonization boost is an extra spray that you can do if, if you are worried about those fungal diseases um, and you, you, you know, you've had that wet, cool period where stuff isn't drying out well enough, um, then you can try and get in there with an extra sp spray um, between, um, between early pink and the petal fall. So your flowers are open at this point. So you're not gonna use any neem, you're not gonna use any fish oils um, or any fish hydrolysate. Um, there is another oil that you can use instead of neem. I, I just learned about this this year. I wrote an article on, on holistic sprays for EcoParent magazine and um, they wanted me to ask permission from Michael Phillips to, to publish his recipe and stuff. And he said, sure, no problem. Here's some new research I've been doing. Um, so I just learned about Karanja oil. I haven't tried it myself yet. Um, it's um, from the Indian beech tree and it, it does some of the similar immune boosting um, stuff that the neem oil does, but it doesn't have the azadiractins in it that uh, can affect pollinators. Um, so, so I guess it is safe to use when the flower is open. So you can use the Karanja oil and you can also, I, I, I think it's a bit cheaper than neem oil. Um, and neem oil is technically 
it's it can be very difficult to get in Canada because um, of the regulations here. So um, uh, you can mix caranda oil and neem oil 50-50 in your recipe and that gives you just more diversity and, and uh, um, uh, potentially a better spray too. So, um, right, so this has has the recipe for that, for the competitive colonization. Um, um, and so, yeah, Wiffle Tree, um, Wiffle Tree Nursery uh, is where I order a lot of my trees from them as well. Um, and they, uh, they'll ship to you. So it, anywhere you are in Canada, basically they'll ship to you. Um, and they have, they have everything you need. Um, Where's my button? So orchard floor management. Um, so um, another big no-no I see a lot of people doing is, is having grass around the base of their trees. And it's really hard for the trees um, to compete with the grass sometimes, especially depending on the type of grass. But um, grass, it basically grass is trying to make the soil bacterial dominant and trees are trying to make it fungal dominant. So uh, they're, oh, <laughs> go to bear, stop it. Um, they're, they're competing with each other and you want your tree to be happy and, so you, and you want fungal dominant soil um, and we're doing things to try and increase the fungal um, life in the soil. So removing your grass is a, a great thing to do. And um, wood chips are what I would recommend putting down around the base of your tree. And if you can get ramial wood chips, it's even better. So ramial wood is from smaller diameter branches that are um, two, two and three quarter inch or seven centimeters in diameter. And um, they're, they produce much more stable hummus. They have um, more soluble lignans and a better balance of carbon to nitrogen in them than larger branches or, and trunks when they're chipped. Um, leaving half, half hazard mulching is good around your property. So under the tree, you're just gonna have, uh, you know, two to three inches of, of mulch um, and top that up every couple of years. But um, you can make piles around your, um, uh, around your property of different ages and uh, sizes um, and, uh, and of different materials. So the ramial wood chips, rotting hay or straw bales, maybe not in the city, but um, depending on how much room you have. Um, I also like to leave um, like piles of, piles of sticks around and rocks um, for habitat, like for, for toads and for ladybugs and things like that. Um, Um, just looking at the questions, Zahara asked, uh, what, what did you say you could mix 50-50? The neem oil and the karanja oil. So the neem oil um, in, is in the, the four main holistic sprays of the spring. Um, if you wanted to mix that with karanja oil instead of using 100% uh, um, neem oil, then you could do that. But in this competitive colonization boost, if you're doing this when the flowers are open, then just use the karanja oil, no, no neem. Um, Shane asks, is there any issue, permaculture going on here, is there any issues mixing raspberry canes under cherry or apple trees? Um, I'll talk about um, guilds in a little bit, um, but um, I mean, raspberry canes specifically, I think just will make it very difficult to harvest your, your cherry or apple tree if they're growing right under, under your tree. You're going to have very scratched up legs <laughs> trying to get that fruit. Um, so additional sprays. Um, oh, sorry, so this is one additional one from Zahara that I believe was missed. It was, um, so after first oh. cover, do you leave the fish oil out of the recipe? Oh, so um, uh, um, yes. That's so you're it's in your four holistic sprays of spring and then after that um, if you're doing sprays later in the season then don't use the fish oil. Great. Okay thanks for catching that. Now do the same pruning rules apply to gooseberry bushes? 
Uh, no, shrubs are, shrubs are a bit different. Um, like gooseberries and currants and stuff. Um, you can, you don't really need to prune much. Um, I, I take out dead wood. Um, they don't need to be kept as, as open. They don't have the same issues. Um, um, generally for kind of renewal pruning of, of fruit to keep, um, high fruit up, production up, um, you could take like a third of the plant out at a time. Um, so some people will just kind of prune, like prune a, a third of it out. Um, and then the, like kind of evenly, or you could just kind of take off part, <laughs> a third of the bush and then work your way around in a circle and remove the next part the next year. Um, but yeah, I, I don't do too much pruning on mine until they get really bushy. Um, okay, so additional sprays. So about a month after petal fall is when your fruit's going to start um, getting bigger and, uh, and the size of your fruit's going to be set. So this is when um, you want to be adding um, calcium and silica. Um, this way is a great way to, to get calcium in. Um, comfrey is also good for calcium. Um, your handout has a list of, um, of some of the ingredients that you can be using in additional sprays. Um, so, um, aerated, right, aerated compost tea, um, so somebody asked a question about, comp about compost teas before. So there's, there's two different ways to make compost tea. You can do an aerated compost tea or an, an anaerobic compost tea. Um, people who follow Elaine Ingham would, will only ever do aerated compost teas, um, but they're a little more complex. Um, they're not as foolproof uh, and they, um, you need some equipment. Um, I mean, a really quick one is just to take some worm castings, put it in a bucket with some water and stir it really vigorously. That's aerating it. <laughs> but really a true aerated compost tea, you're bubbling for kind of 24 to 48 hours. And, um, and you're, you're trying to get the right mix of, of bacteria and fungus in it and stuff. Um, I am not an expert on, on aerated compost teas, um, but, uh, but you can... I do have a kit. I just, <laughs> I just don't use it much because I'm a really minimalist gardener. So the least amount of work I can do, the better. So from this brings us to fermented herbal teas, um, and this is where you just fill a bucket, like fill a five gallon or ten gallon pail with weeds, basically, or particular plants. If you're uh, like if you're looking for extra calcium or silica, you might want horsetail or um, or comfrey, um, and you'll fill up your pail with that and then uh, pour a bit of boiling water over it to, to kind of get things activated and then fill the rest with rainwater or well water that doesn't is non-chlorinated let it sit for a week until it's really stinky and your husband wants you to throw it out but you say no wait it's there's so much good stuff in it and then you drain out all the gunky slimy herbs that have been soaking in there and put them in your compost um, and then you're left with this smelly tea um, and you can dilute that and add it to your backpack sprayer um, and um, so you, you know things like stinging nettle comfrey horsetail I mentioned um, stinging nettle is, stinging nettle is also really good for calcium potassium um, and then um, if you grow garlic um, or if you have any perennial alliums um, um, anything in the allium family, but especially garlic. If you have garlic, you can just use the scapes. So when you're taking your scapes off, save some to make um, uh, pesto because it's really good and to cook with, but usually you have more than you need. Um, and then you can, you can throw those in your bucket. Um, and somehow the garlic um, uh, increases the absorption of these minerals um, into the leaf. So it, it, it opens up the stomates in the leaf and uh, and it allows the, the nutrients to get in more readily. So it's always good to add a little garlic into your, into your teas. Um, serenade is a commercial fungicide um, that you can get that um, is, uh, it, it does what we're trying to do here. It colonizes the, the tree with, um, with a beneficial bacteria called Bacillus subtilis. Um, it's not, so it's not harmful to beneficial insects. Um, 
and then uh, you can make, so if you have trunk borers, um, you can make a, a trunk spray that has a higher neem concentration. Usually we're doing it at a 0.5% concentration, but you can do a 1% concentration just to spray the trunk. Hi, buddy. Oh, you're hungry, aren't you? I'm sorry. You'll have to wait a little bit. Um, uh, what about, how much tea would you give per, per plant? Um, yeah, sorry, the handouts will be sent um, afterwards. Uh, they'll be emailed out to everybody. Um, how much tea would you give per plant? Um, you, you can dilute, um, you take like one, uh, one quart into a, a four or five gallon backpack sprayer. So it's diluted pretty well. Um, and gar would garlic mustard have any e efficacy? Garlic mustard is not related to garlic. It's not in the allium family. So um, it, 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 it wouldn't work in the same way. So in the fall, you want to do um, three of these four things for your tree. This is helping set you up for a good, uh, a good spring. So um, leaf liming, so scattering um, calcitic lime around uh, the leaves when a third to half of the leaves have fallen, and you can kind of flip them around a bit as you spread this to get them all over. Um, and this is really especially good for fungal scab. Um, doing another holistic spray when, when half the leaves have fallen off the tree. And um, in this one, it says this all in the handouts too, you can, you can use double the neem, and double the microbes and double the liquid fish at this point. Um, aggressively mowing, so this is where you're also trying to break up any disease organisms um, and flip over the leaves and stuff and break them up into little bits so that they, uh, they decompose well um, and spreading compost. So you want the tree to be fully dormant before you spread compost around the base of the tree because um, otherwise you could um, you could kind of bring it out of dormancy and it could cause harm if it's not if it's not ready for winter when winter hits. Um, uh, just let me uh, yeah I don't think I so um, I guess I hadn't talked yet about, um, uh, I didn't touch on the guilds yet. So uh, somebody asked about planting raspberry canes under your tree. So in permaculture, we do, um, we plant guilds with our fruit trees. Um, and uh, we go into this in, in the, the workshop we're going to be doing in September, the introduction to permaculture. And then in the full day permaculture workshop in October, um, we'll get, get into even more detail on it. Um, but basically you're planting certain plants around your tree to help the tree be healthy um, and to, to attract pollinators and repel pests um, and, and help the immunity of the tree. And um, so, I mean, Michael Phillips says not, he, he prefers not to plant things right under the tree until they're at least five years old. I, I start planting stuff under it before that. Um, but I do, you do want to have some space around. So I'd leave a good two foot buffer um, around the trunk of your tree and not have stuff right in that zone, just so you're not competing with the roots. Um, it also makes it easy for little gnawing rodents to come, um, hide and come up to your trunk and nibble your trunk. So having open space around the base of your tree is good for, for airflow, for, um, for pest control, <laughs> rodent control, um, and, uh, and to not, to not be competing with the um, the uh, root of the tree too much. Um, so winter prep, rodents, we, good segue. Um, so tree collars are super important. Um, there's those wraparound white collars that spiral up. Um, they're readily available at any hardware store. They're not my preferred choice of collars. Um, sometimes people forget to take them off and they, they start girdling the tree. They can, they can cut off the circulation of the tree. Um, uh, but they do, they are nice to be able to kind of work around branches. If you have low branches, you can kind of just have the branch stick out through the wrap at one point. Um, 
I like these plant, they're called plantra collars, P-L-A-N, oh, I have it in the next column under deer. Um, so plantra collars uh, are good for deer control and for road control. And they come, you can get two foot, three foot or five foot lengths. And um, they're available at Grimo Nut Nursery, but I think they're also available through Whiffle Tree now. Um, so keeping vegetation short around the base of the tree um, or not having vegetation around the base of the tree like we just talked about is good so that because rodents don't like they don't want the birds and other predators to see them running around they like to hide under vegetation so keep that away from the base of your tree um, sharp gravel uh, like a gravel can also be unpleasant for rodents to walk on so I, I have never tried doing that but you can keep that around the base of your tree I've heard as a trick um, and then snowfall um, if, you, if you pack the snow down, it's harder for roads to tunnel through. So just kind of visit your tree regularly and stomp down the, the snow around. Because um, also as the snow gets deeper, then sometimes they can kind of rise up higher in the in, and, uh, and get above your tree collar, like bunnies and stuff might be able to reach above your tree collar. Um, deer, um, deer aren't as much of a problem in the city. Um, you can you can fence one tree um but deer can jump six feet so you need to, you need the tree to be um like the fencing to be right up close to the tree so that they can't jump so there's nowhere for them to jump into if you're fencing several trees um then you really need a high fence to be able to uh to keep them out there's a couple different brands of scoot that basically smells like predator um, like their predator urine um, that can keep them away. Um, and then there's uh, Sepp Holzer is a, a permaculturist who has this bone sauce recipe that you, you have to ruin a cast iron pot for um, and you, you cook the bones in a um, kind of like how you would make charcoal but with bones and then you paint that on. We were going to experiment this with that at a, a local food forest, a public food forest in London, but um, we never did, so I'm not sure how effective it is. I haven't tried it myself. Um, so that's it for uh, my part of the presentation. There's still some time, still about almost 20 minutes for dis for questions and discussion. Um, uh, I see another question just came up. Um, oops. Um, I have some leaves turning yellow starting from the tip on my apple trees. I'm assuming I could water more deeply but otherwise no big deal. Um, yeah I mean the trees have been pretty stressed this year with drought um, so uh, it, it, like some some trees are already starting to have yellow leaves that and they're they're losing their leaves because they just they, they were not happy um, during that hot hot dry spell. Um, so it's always really good to be when you're watering to be watering really deeply. So rather than watering, you know, every day or every few days, water once a week or less and um, and water, you know, put your hose on a small slow drip or get a, a, a 10 gallon pail um, and put a couple of holes in the bottom, just little like uh, quarter inch holes and uh, fill that with water and that'll slowly drain out. That's about how much bucket it'll need every week, a young tree and um or two of those if it's really dry i know go to bear um and uh uh yeah it's better to have a long slow watering and then dig down you know scrape the soil back a couple of inches and see sometimes you're amazed you like you're like oh i've been watering for so long and then i'll scrape the soil away and there's you know a, a, an inch that's wet and it's totally dry under that i'm like what <laughs> so you really got to let it you know let it have a, a long slow drip so that you get you get the water down deep and then the roots go down deep to find it um, and then they can take care of themselves better the next time that they're they're short of water if you water shallowly and frequently then you're gonna have shallow roots they're not going to be able to fend for themselves as much um, can you address grasshoppers mm grasshoppers what's the issue with grasshoppers on f eating fruit trees oh um i don't know i haven't had a problem with grasshoppers um i mean if they're eating your fruit tree your fruit tree is not healthy okay they're eating all the leaves of your fruit tree wow so 
uh, then you really need to address the immune system of your tree. Your, your tree needs, you, I would be doing those holistic sprays. Um, you could still do, um, you could do a couple sprays this summer still, but then in the fall, give it a really good dose of compost and, uh, and do that last spray of the fall. Um, and, uh, and then do your sprays in the spring and, and you're, if you can boost the immunity of your tree and, and get healthy soil, then they, the grasshoppers won't be able to digest it and they're just not going to be interested at all. Um, I've been doing five gallons a week in fairly clay soil. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what's going on there then. Um, It, it could just be going into early dormancy um, because of the weather we've been having. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, a few people have said thanks. Uh, they have to go. Is oh, there a way you'd recommend? Jessica, there, I think there's a couple more polls that we didn't do. I suppose we could do oh, that yeah. before everybody heads out. That's one, a good point. Let's... I remember one was, uh, have you ever re received a tree from one of our tree depots? So back in June, Reforest London did right. some tree giveaways and uh, I know we reached out to the people who received trees. So I'm curious to know if anybody um, got a tree from us. Yeah. So yes this year, yes in a previous year or no. Uh, and there'll be another question about whether you're in the London area. So maybe some people haven't received a tree because they're not in the London area. but. It's a great program if you are in London. Somebody, actually, I did notice someone said earlier that they don't have room for any more trees thanks to Reforest London. <laughs> That's so a, goal. a good and bad to problem hear. to have. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Well, thank you for contributing to the Million Tree Challenge. <laughs> oh, make sure to register those trees too for anybody who doesn't know. If you plant any tree, whether it's from us or just from any other store or nursery, if you go to milliontrees.ca and register it, then uh, we can help get to one million in London. Okay, so I think um, everybody who's going to vote has voted. So 70% uh, haven't gotten trees yet from Reforest London. There's an opportunity there, Kelsey. There um, and yes, in previous years. So not nobody got any this year. We'll definitely um, do at least one big tree giveaway um, for National Forest Week in September, towards the end of September. So um, I don't think we've publicized that yet, but um, do be on the lookout and just follow us on social media. Great. Um, and then there's one more poll, where are you watching from? Just to kind of give us an idea. The, the benefit of webinars is that we can have people from, last time we had somebody from Sarnia and Windsor and uh, Burlington, I think. So it's nice to reach a broader audience um, and we can accommodate a lot more people too. Is there a way you'd recommend to get rid of tent caterpillars? We had to cut some branches off our trees. They are, there are some on the city trees. We're wondering if they'll spread. Um, tent caterpillars generally are more um, aesthetic of a problem. I mean, I have seen <laughs> Kelsey's from Sudbury and is there now. I've seen like crazy infestations up there where there's literally like road slicks, like the road is like greased with their smooshed bodies and like that's a problem. The, what we have down here is it's really more of an aesthetic problem. <laughs> it's not gonna cart kill the trees um, and uh, um, yeah, I, it's again the same comment with the grasshoppers. If your tree is healthy, the caterpillars won't be able to eat it. So they're going to pass it by and move on to a different tree. So, um, yeah, I mean, things eat the caterpillars too. So, the Japanese beetles, not so many things eat them. So that's different. But ten caterpillars are a good source of food too. So I'm, I'm more inclined to just leave them. Um, okay, let's close the poll. Where are you watching from? 60% in London, 20% Middlesex but outside of London, 10% in southwestern Ontario, which is one person in our size. Uh, one international. Exciting. Maybe that was the lime tree questions and avocado trees. Sorry I couldn't help out as much with those. I'm not... Uh, I'm just, that might have been stoned. Molly from Texas. Oh. <laughs> Yes, Texas is a very different growing climate. Um, 
Okay, back to the questions. Um, I can read it if you'd like. Do you have any suggestions specifically towards um, gear towards pawpaws on what can be an animal deterrent to them to stop eating all the leaves? Oh, geared towards pawpaws. I mean, pa I wouldn't treat pawpaws any different than any other fruit trees. Protect them with, uh, I mean, if your trees are too small for a collar, um, then maybe you just need to make a little fence around them. Pawpaws are usually we plant pretty young because they have a taproot. Um, so maybe they're too small for a collar. Um, just, yeah, build a little fence around them temporarily until they're big enough to put collars on. Um, we have an apple tree that has two main branches, equally strong, should one be cut off as a thinning cut? How, it depends on how big those branches are, Mary. Um, oh, so, okay, sorry, back to the pawpaw. They are, there is a fence up, but it's still happening. So they're getting through the fence. Are you sure it's, it's deer and, well, it, how, are they, how are they getting through the fence? Maybe it's insects. They're kicking it over. Haha, <laughs> resourceful buggers. <laughs> Start eating them. Um, I build a stronger fence. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> if sure you mentioned um, things like scoot earlier, or I'm not sure if um, you think they're fully natural or anything, but I know there's deer repellents that you can kind of paint on to the branches of your trees. So maybe you can do that with pawpaws like any other tree. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, I don't believe it's toxic, but it's, it just tastes unappetizing. So it kind of makes them not want to eat it anymore. Um, and, and right then Naomi said to dig the fence under the ground as well, uh, which is a good idea because yeah, bunnies will burrow. Um, can this recording be shared? Yes, I think the recording will be emailed out with the handouts. Um, I'm just going to back up. Uh, if there's new questions coming in, I'll get them in a minute, but I know we missed a few. So um, Right, so Mary had said, we have an apple tree that has two main branches, equally strong, should one be cut off? Um, oh, they're two inches. So, I don't know. Um, it's a bit iffy at this point. If they were smaller, if they were an inch, I'd say for sure, go for it. Two inches diameter. Um, it should probably still recover from. Um, I'm assuming they have a very narrow uh, angle between them. So you're gonna have problems with, with moisture and rot happening there um, for a long time. So I, I'd say, yeah, it's probably better to, um, it's probably better to, uh, to remove one of those now when you, when you still can. Um. Let's see. Uh, oh, I met you at Boulder Mountain Festival. Oh, awesome. That was at the Mantis Festival many years ago. Becky's not running that anymore. That was a fun eco festival for a couple of years. Oh, man, Molly's from Texas. Two, somebody got two pears and an elderberry. That's great. Oh, I think one was that was missed was if I still feel not confident to prune, is there some way I can get help with it? Um, yeah, sure, yeah, I can come help with pruning um, and kind of guide you through, we can like, and then we can work on your own tree and talk about it and kind of help you and you can make the cuts. <laughs> I'll just tell you what to cut. <laughs> um, and that'll help build your confidence. Yeah, we could just we could do that. If you're in if you're in London, if you're outside of London, uh, we'd have to, yeah, figure something out a, a bit of a travel fee or something. Um, so there was another question. We have three trees that have broken clean off at the ground level, all apple trees that are three years old. Well, if they, yeah, if they broke off at ground level, then you've lost, you've, all you have left is the rootstock. If they're re-sprouting, Mary, then they're, um, they're, 
they're not going to be the variety of apple that you, you want them to be. Um, so I would just start fresh. I'm not sure how they broke, um, whether it was deer or bunnies or what. Um, but I, at, I, at this point, you just need to get new ones, I think. Um, and so, yeah, I didn't quite talk about um, uh, bare root versus potted trees, but um, I really only, unless I really can't for some reason, I only plant bare root trees in the early spring um, or in late fall. And um, so you, you get the tree in the mail, it's shipped in a box, or you, you can pick it up in the nursery, but it's dormant when you get it. And it's just got all its roots. There's no soil on the roots. There's no pot. Um, oh. And <laughs> I know you're there, Cody Bear. Um, but the tree will do much. It, it's been grown in soil, in native soil, uh, its whole life. It hasn't been babied by being watered every day and been being given like little fertilizer pellets and it's not had an IV drip its whole life with all the stuff that you get in a nursery potted plant. So um, once you plant it, it'll be ready to just, its roots are going to be ready to grow. Its roots have been pruned. Um, and so they're ready to grow and, uh, and they can deal with finding their own food, finding their own water, um, establishing themselves in, in regular, regular old soil. Um, so it, it, you might get a slightly bigger tree um, by buying a potted tree, but it'll basically go into shock for the next five years after you plant it. So it's better to just wait until you can get a bare root and uh, don't ever buy those trees at the end of the season sale at the nursery that have been suffering all summer. And you think you got a really great deal on them, but they're not gonna grow for, for you for five years because <laughs> they're gonna be in shock. Um, did I? I think that's all the questions back up now. Okay, well, new one. We have one tree in front that dogs love to pee on. The bark on the dog pee side is bleached out. Do you recommend any natural deterrence for our furry friends or just let them do their thing? Can you plant something prickly in front of it, like like raspberry canes? Or raspberry is going to spread though. It's going to be hard to keep away from the tree. Um, a gooseberry plant or. Um, uh, a sunflower barrier or something, a row of sunflowers to keep them away. I don't know. Any other questions? We've got like two more minutes. If not, I just want to take a moment to thank everybody for watching and for sticking through uh, for two hours and listening to all this really great information. And thanks so much to Jessica for coming on. We always love to have you because you just have so much knowledge. Um, and it's so applicable to anybody who has fruit trees. So hopefully everybody took away a lot of good stuff and can apply it. And um, as mentioned, you'll get those handouts and the recording. Great, thanks everybody. Oh, do you recommend any good squirrel proof netting for fruit trees? <laughs> no, squirrels, you just have to plant enough to overwhelm them really, uh, or individually wrap your, <laughs> your fruit. Uh, when, they're, when they're smaller, you can kind of cage them or put bird, bird netting on them, but squirrels are very smart and tricky. Okay, good luck everybody with your fruit trees, and I hope they are productive for you. Thanks. All right, have a great night.